Tonight marks the 52nd Carlos Kelly McClatchy Carlos Kelly McClatchy Symposium, and as a professor who has spent 15 years working in McClatchy Hall, uh, I couldn't be happier to have the support of Susan McClatchy and the McClatchy family. For decades, the McClatchy family has supported the Department of Communication, and we, we are just thrilled to have you here. Today, as a new kind of medium is entering our lives, virtual reality, we want to continue to ask the type of questions that has driven so many of the McClatchy family's efforts. How do we think about media, in this case virtual reality, as it relates to the public interest? Susan McClatchy didn't just show up tonight. We're happy that she showed up tonight, but she showed up and she put on the goggles and she walked the plank. <laughs> There are some other special people in this room that I want to thank for their support, uh, not just of virtual reality, but of the Department of Communication in general. First of all, Dr. Fred Turner, our es <laughs> the esteemed chair of the Department of Communication. He's the one that said, huh, why don't we make the symposium this year be about virtual reality? We have to think about the public interest. Let's get ahead of this conversation and think about issues that are going to affect us all in VR now, and what's continue to support the values the McClatchy family has shown by considering what can go right and what can go wrong with VR as it relates to policy. Dr. Richard Soller. Has been the Dean of the School of Humanities and Science, the Vernon R. and Elizabeth Warren Anderson Dean since 2007. His support for my lab, for our department, for social science and humanities in general has not wavered for 10 years. Uh, when I meet colleagues from other universities, I often tell them, I have a dean, and, and when I ask him for something, he just says yes. <laughs> or at least the default is yes. You, you try to get to yes. And uh, we really appreciate that and your, your support. And last but not least, it is an absolute honor to have President Tessier Levine here. He gets invited to about 10 dinners a night, and, and, and he and his wife Mary have joined us uh, because Susan McClatchy and the McClatchy family, everything you do to us is so special. So we really appreciate you being here. Uh, President Tessier Levine also walked the plank. And we're very proud of him for that. The title of tonight's event is How VR Will Shape People, Business, and Government Policy. So the way the night's going to go, we're going to talk for about a total of an hour and 20 minutes. First, I'm going to give some basic background on virtual reality, why the medium is unique, why it's powerful, and why now is the time to be having this conversation. I'm only going to talk for about five minutes. Then, Dr. Courtney Cogburn, is going to present her work on Thousand Cut Journey, which is a virtual reality experience uh, that is an experience designed to combat racism. And it will premiere at the Tribeca Film Festival this April. In addition to Dr. Cogburn, uh, we have our own Elise Ogle, a Stanford Department of Communication master's graduate and undergraduate, who is also a creator of the film in the room with us. And The piece couldn't be more timely. My goal for inviting Dr. Cogburn to come here to speak was to find an absolutely brilliant scholar who is epitomizing using VR to do work in the public interest uh, in, in line with the great vision of the McClatchy family. And I, there could not be a more perfect person than Courtney to do this, and we're thrilled to have you here today. <laughs> Next. Philip Rosedale, one of the true pioneers in the VR space, is going to tell us about virtual reality's history and virtual reality's future. As a founder and former CEO of Second Life, one can make the argument that he literally created a planet. Okay? This planet had its own population, its own economy, its own culture, and its own laws. There is nobody alive, and I'm not saying this lightly, 
who knows about the trials and the tribulations of virtual life at scale than Philip Rosedale. And he is going to recount the lessons he's learned in all the time at Second Life and in his new venture, uh, High Fidelity, specifically as they relate to what people, families, businesses, and governments need to do from a policy perspective. We're here to not make the same mistakes we've made in the past, learn from what Philip discovered in Second Life, and apply that to the future. Last but not least, Janine Zakaria will interview Commissioner Wheeler. Janine is not only a renowned journalist, but she's also an innovator in the virtual reality space. She co-created uh, with Jerry Miglitz a class on immersive journalism, uh, and they taught that class in 2016 at Stanford. It was the first class of its kind, really pushing the boundaries on how we use VR for storytelling. Most of you know Chairman Wheeler as the guy that saved the internet with net neutrality. Okay. But I actually know him as that guy from DC that actually knows something about VR. Okay. Right. He came to visit in 2016 and was stunned to see he knew more about hardware, content, uh, issues surrounding public interest than anyone that I'd ever seen. He'd been to Facebook and Oculus, he'd been to a number of companies in the Valley, and he was just amazingly informed to think about how we can get ahead of the curve to think about virtual reality. And the point of tonight, just to put a, a, a final stamp on it, we want to have a tough conversation tonight and really talk about the downsides and the amazing opportunities in VR to try to get ahead of any mistakes we can make and to try to just think about what we can do uh, with all the power in this room, and this room is vast, uh, to think about doing the right thing when it comes to VR. Some ground rules for questions and answers. Uh, you have index cards at your table. If you want to ask a question to speakers, you can write a question on the card. We're only going to have time for one or two questions, so I apologize for that. And last but not least, I, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, please take a moment and look around at your table. Uh, you have a lot of special people at this table. And uh, um, to me, the fact that you spent your time on this Friday night to come here, uh, and uh, we're all really busy, and it's really special that you're here. So thank you to all of you for coming. Okay, VR. How many, anyone never tried VR? Raise your hand if you've never tried VR. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, I'm going to be brief here then. We all have done VR. Uh, what makes VR special as a medium is there's a few things. The first is that it responds to your body. You're not hitting a button using a mouse. You're stepping towards objects and they get bigger. You're turning your head and sounds get louder. You're using your hands and grabbing things. Hence, we are leveraging the neural mechanisms that humans have used for hundreds of thousands of years and behavior feels real. In addition to leveraging this so-called embodied cognition, VR is perceptually surrounding. If you're watching a television and you turn your head away, it goes away. VR, no matter where you look, there it is. The system is also designed to block out the physical world. Hence, the only senses you're getting, sight, sound, and sometimes touch, are completely taken over by the virtual reality system. The next thing that makes VR special is it's multi-sensory. So when you're in a good VR simulation, if you close your eyes, you're still hearing spatialized sound, you're still getting haptic virtual touch feedback, and sometimes smell. It's multi-sensory, it's very different from other media that we've had in the past. The final thing that makes VR unique is that it is networked and social, and people are in it together. So if you think about your table names, where do the table names come from? They're all characters from the best book ever called Neuromancer. Okay, I'll go home and read that novel. Uh, it's a t I use it as a text in my virtual people class at Stanford. Uh, William Gibson defines virtual reality as a consensual hallucination. People having senses together. And VR, by definition, is people getting together and experiencing things. So for these reasons, VR, it's a very different medium. Uh, normally at this point, I would talk about all these experiments that show that VR is far more compelling than the physical world or than 2D media, for example, watching TV. But instead of doing that, uh, Dr. Cogburn is going to give us one really amazing deep dive on it. So I'm, I'm going to pause on that. And I'm going to talk about why today's special. Okay? So I brought props. <laughs> this is the Virtual Research V8. I used it in 1999. This is what I learned virtual reality on. It cost $15,000. 
And in the history of the world, they made, I did a bunch of due diligence for tonight, they made about 3,000 of them. Okay. This is, I can't even lift it up, uh, it's heavy. Uh, this is the SX-111. Uh, in 2013, it was cutting edge. Uh, it cost $40,000. It weighs about five pounds. You can see my hand uh, wavering here. Uh, and when the so-called VR consumer revolution begins in 2013, thanks to some of the people in this room, when the VR revolution begins, this is the best HMD money can buy. It costs $35,000, and there are 500 of them in the world. Uh, a lot of you did VR demos before coming in today, and in alphabetical order, you did the HTC Vive, the Oculus Rift, the Samsung Gear, and then going back, the Google Cardboard, okay? I wanted to represent all the companies that were here. Uh, so to say that again, Google Cardboard, HTC Vive, the Oculus Rift, and the Samsung Gear. Those are the four goggles that we have outside. Those four goggles, if you went to Best Buy now and bought all four of them, it would cost $1,000 total to have all four of them. Conservatively, there are about 15 million of them in the U.S., and that is conservatively. The number is probably closer to twice that. So we are at a point in time where this hardware has gone from the price of a car to the price of you know, one of the bottles of wine that we're drinking tonight. Okay? <laughs> so as I close this part of the, the night, this is a really important time. We have a medium that, you know, Fred Turner, a cultural story, and he and I argue sometimes, he says media is the same and it's not that new, and, you know, we were afraid of novels back in the day. Uh, something tells me that VR is different, that it's not just adding more pixels to make it HD or color to television, that there's something about using your body and being perceptive surrounded that is different. So um, our first speaker is Courtney Cogburn, and she is going to tell us about a project that I believe is uh, brilliant, critically important and couldn't be coming at a better time. Is the mic on? Hello? Okay, there we go. So I have a vivid memory of my Facebook news feed the day I learned Trayvon Martin was killed. I had a few friends who were actually pregnant with black boys, black females who were pregnant with black boys, and they were complaining of not being able to sleep, crying, angry, lamenting the fact that they were bringing children into this world. Juxtaposed to that, some of my white friends were a little oblivious, especially in the early days of learning of this tragedy. They were still posting kitten memes and cupcake recipes. Um, it was clear, some of them were talking about Trayvon, but it was clear that they weren't carrying the death of this child in their bodies in quite the same way. They weren't connecting with the death of this stranger in quite the same way. I think I have a clicker, let me grab it. So I have since become the mother of a delightfully precocious little boy. <laughs> He's fun. Um, just this morning we were FaceTiming and he did a performance of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and he's dancing and swaying around the room and it really just started my day with joy and light. But as the mother of a black child, there's always this undercurrent of worry. I worry when the oohs and ahs of strangers will turn into clutched purses and perceptions of threat. Will there come a time when this special and beautiful little boy will be seen as just a black body to fear? I have to consider this as a parent. So for me, Trayvon is not a stranger. He's my son. The threat that killed him is something that I actively consider every day, both as a mother and as a scientist. As a scientist, my work is really focused on the effects of racism on health. And it's really driven by this persistent and stubborn pattern in our public health data that suggests that blacks are, uh, have an earlier onset, faster progression, and earlier death for the 15 leading causes of death. Various cancer, stroke, hypertension. And what's especially terrifying about this pattern is that it persists at every level of socioeconomic status. Even when we account for education and income and even quality of health insurance, this difference by race, particularly between blacks and whites, persists. <clears throat> Why should race matter for health? How do we explain that I am more likely to die faster than my white counterparts in spite of my education and income? 
In this work, we are addressing some of these questions. This collision of this deeply personal part of my life and this professional side of my life is leading me to questions around what would it take what would it take for you to understand that racism is more complex than being called a name or even violence experienced at the hands of police? What would it take for you to accept that we still live in a world where the color of your skin can get you killed? Denied a loan, denied housing, denied a job. What would it take for the videos and reports of black bodies being gunned down to register as a pattern of racism and not merely a consequence of insubordination or criminality? What would it take for outcries of racial injustice to register as more than a sensitivity or a card that's being played, rather than an unacceptable social reality? What would it take for you to not just feel bad or even empathize, but to act and think differently? To refuse to live in a world where racial injustice and racism can dictate your quality of life, your health, and your well being. I am grateful to live and work in a space where people share my beliefs of justice and equality. But I often find that there's a disconnect that people who espouse beliefs of racial justice and racial equality don't always understand racial injustice and racial inequality. They don't always get how that shows up in people's lives in a substantive way. I find that it's easier to build consensus on what should be the ideal world we all like to live in and much more difficult to build consensus on what is, especially when it comes to issues of racial inequality. So this led me to question, how can I bridge this gap? How can I help people understand a reality that's not their own? When I first started exploring these ideas, I came to virtual reality as a concept, but I had actually never used the technology. I'd never worn a headset. But I felt that this possibility of walking in someone else's shoes around issues of race and racism could be powerful in making connections. When I emailed Jeremy and his team, cold, he didn't know me, I asked, hey, might you be interested in exploring issues of racism in virtual reality? And to my surprise, for a total novice, he said yes, enthusiastically. He was interested in getting into the details of this. And we both believed that based on the empirical data that suggests that virtual reality can be a powerful tool in changing attitudes and behaviors in ways that are quite different than other forms of media, perhaps we could be on to something here. When we sought funding from our funders, Manish, hello, from the Brown Institute for Media Innovation that's based here at Columbia as well as, sorry, not here, here at Stanford and at Columbia, we didn't actually know what we were going to do. We were kind of hedging our bets that we were onto something important, that virtual reality could be powerful, and yet we didn't know what we were going to create. And as you can imagine, it can be difficult to convince people to give you money when you don't actually know what you're going to do with that money. But we were successful, and we were able to pursue this wonderful relationship over the course of the year, exploring the possibilities of this tech. Not knowing what we were going to do actually turned out to be important. It led us to this blank slate, and it allowed our interdisciplinary team to come together to solve and think through a problem. We had communication scholars, psychologists, social workers, creative technologists, computer scientists, artists, all bringing their perspectives and expertise to the question of authentically and meaningfully representing racism in virtual reality. The result of what we've created is a multi-scene life course experience through the lens of Michael Sterling, a black male. We have you walk through experiences as Michael at age seven, 15, and 30. At age seven, you're in an elementary school classroom. You are engaging with your peers, tossing and throwing blocks. But when you throw the block, this elicits a negative response from your white female teacher. Michael, you're being dangerous. You're going to hurt someone. It doesn't matter that the other kids were also playing with, with the blocks and throwing them in the same manner. You get put into timeout. You're then looking at your face in the mirror while you observe your white peers continue to play, sort of laugh and avert their eyes in response to you. 
Another important part of our process, and it's important to note here, is that this is all based on empirical data and personal narratives. These things have actually happened and happen regularly. Different disciplinary practices in classrooms on the basis of race are driving part of the content that we're developing in this experience. At age 15, you are late for a basketball game. You are heading out of the door with your friend Adam, but your mother stops you and says, you need to change. I'm watching the news and the police are looking for someone who's wearing something very similar to you. You resist because you're running late. And she says, don't forget what happened to your brother. This triggers a response where you can then grab a jacket to change as you head out of the door. In spite of changing, you then, because of a minor infraction of crossing the street and jaywalking, this elicits a response from the police where you are forced to get on your knees and raise your hands and they're acting very aggressively toward you. Again, this might seem extreme, but this is based on data on stop and frisk practices in New York City. This type of thing actually happens all the time. At age 30, you are applying for a job. You're well prepared, you're well educated, you're a finalist for the job of your dreams. In this process though, you are standing and waiting for the interviewer and the interviewer comes in and ignores you completely and goes directly to the white male candidate who's sitting near you and says, you must be our candidate from Yale. He's not, you are. The secretary who's in the scene reminds the interviewer that you are indeed the candidate from Yale and the interviewer then turns and acknowledges your presence for the first time. You later get a message, and there's other things that happen in the scene, but you later get a message that you weren't a good cultural fit, but best of luck in your search. We spent approximately eight months on just the content. There's nuance and there's images in the background, there's narrative that is explicit and blatant, but also subtle and very complex in what we were trying to create and capture. It was important that this registered as authentic and meaningful and not just a cool trick in VR. So part of what we are exploring in this work is really based on this premise, that achieving racial justice requires that we understand racism and not an understanding that only emerges from intellectual exercise or even in the production and consumption of science and data, but an understanding that is visceral, that connects to spirit and body as much as reason. So I look forward to talking about these and other issues in terms of the possibilities of using VR with you, and thank you for allowing me time to talk about our work. Okay, um, thank you, Courtney. So, can you tell us a little bit more about the process of choosing what happens in the scenes? How did you settle on these scenes? What was, uh, how did you get there? You know, it really started, and you were there, <laughs> it really started with um, brainstorming, I think, 50 plus ideas on a whiteboard, really trying to capture different aspects of, of racism. And then that led us to wanting to put as much as possible in one experience. And we thought the way to do that is to capture that this is not just something that happens at age seven or the one time someone calls you a name. It's something that you're carrying with you across your life course and how could we go about doing that. Um, so it was really through the collaboration of the team and thinking about these different experiences that led us to this more uh, rich, multi-scene life course experience. So what is the next step? <laughs> um, I think it's important that to, you know, to emphasize that this was exploratory. We didn't know if this was possible. We didn't know if it would be useful. Uh, now we're in the process of collecting data. So we have an experimental design where we're interested in not just claiming that we might be influencing uh, media, I mean, sorry, influencing empathy or bias or even behavioral change, but actually documenting whether we're moving that needle for different groups. And that is an important step. As you know, sometimes it does what you want it to do and sometimes it doesn't. And it's possible that either in the short term or long term, we might see different effects. And I think that's an important step before we move to any sort of public engagement, say beyond Tribeca, um, of, of the experience we've created. Okay, so, so in this room you have uh, decision makers at the four major VR tech companies. Um, what would your ask be for them? You know, I think 
the ask is that they engage in a similar process to the one that we've engaged in in developing this project. Think about the significance of taking someone who thinks about race and racism all the time as part of her research and linking them to someone with the technical expertise and imagining what you might create together. The transdisciplinary approach to this project, bringing people from different areas of expertise and perspectives was critical to what we were able to produce. This is not something I would have come up with on my own sitting at a computer, even if I had the technical expertise. You need people who are rooted in the complexities of the social issue, working with those who have the technical expertise, working with those who are visual artists and think about auditory and other aspects of the experience coming together to create. Um, and it's, it's challenging to do that. You need to, when you're trying to tackle complex social issues, those problems are solved at intersections and integrations of disciplines and not in isolation. Right, let me push you a little harder there because that wasn't much of an ask. I mean, they, they should be doing that yesterday. Like, okay. what, <laughs> what, what do you want them to do? Do you want them to make this part of the package when you buy one of their headsets, this comes with it? What, what's the dream? If this does what we think it will do, um, I think it should be supported so that we can scale it in widespread access. Um, I've already thought about ways that this might be integrated in the National African American History Museum along with other content, how this might be integrated with existing educational curriculum, how this might be integrated with diversity and equity training programs within organizations. There's so many implications. The hope is that someone who goes through this experience comes out more open willing to learn and understand these structural issues related to race and racism. So if you think that's possible, any additional training and education on top of that becomes ex exponentially more effective than if they were closed down and thought they already got this and they, they, they're tired of hearing these sorts of things. So connecting with cultural components, connecting with education curriculum, connecting with training and helping this work be scaled in that way, if it does what we think it does, um, I think it's an important next step and it would be great to get support to do that. I think that's a great way to end. Join me in thanking Dr. Cogburn. I would next like to invite uh, Philip Rosedale to the stage. Thanks. There we are. Okay, it. so in this room we have about Half of the people have spent time or seen even <laughs> images of Second Life. Half of them haven't. So okay. tell, us, tell us what it's like to be in Second Life. What, what, what are you doing? What are you seeing? Bring us there. Well, you know, even before the VR headsets that we're looking at now, and we're all in the middle of watching Get Adopted, even before that, what Second Life was was just this. It was the, you know, as closely as possible. Uh, what we were trying to do, what I was trying to do, was create a world that was real and that we as people could go into and have jobs and have adventures and wander around and fly. Well, of course, we can't do that in the real world, but, you know, fly along and see landscapes unfolding ahead of us. That was my dream since I was a kid to do. So I love that conceptually. You're in Second Life. What are you doing? You're sitting down. Imagine... Uh, I was there a couple of weeks ago, and uh, uh, I found a space that I hadn't seen before. I had not been back in a while, and there was a, it was London. It was a, a square in London, and there were a hundred people standing around in little groups. And it looks, I mean, you're there. I mean, even without the headset, you're there. And they're all chatting about different things, and I walked up and said hi. And, Somebody asked who I was, and the naming in Second Life told them that it was me at Philip Rose. The way Second Life works, if you're an old-timer, you know, oh my gosh, it's him. You know, it's the guy that started the thing, and I'm chatting. So, so one thing you do is you just wander into a public place and strike up a conversation with people. And of course, as easy as that seems in the real world, in the virtual world, that's a pretty novel idea. That's what we're So how do you for. walk in Second Life? Well, you, you, in Second Life, you use the keyboard, and you, you, know, you push the forward key, and you watch yourself from behind, walk along. Of course, that idea of watching yourself is so important because you're, because you're interacting with other real people that are talking to you with voice, with text. You suddenly take on and start building this persona that becomes your avatar and becomes the second you. Great. All right, so you're hitting buttons. You're seeing avatars move around. What year did you found uh, Lyndon in Second Life? 
I started it in 1999. Uh, Second Life really launched in 2003. It became very well known in about 2006. So it took a long time to build. Right, so I've heard you say before that the size of Second Life geographically is equal to Los Angeles. What, is, what does that mean? Well, Second Life today, and uh, Eb, Ebe is here somewhere, our leader. There he is, uh, who's the CEO of uh, uh, Second Life Today. Thank you, Ebe. Uh, Second Life Today, Ebe can correct me if I'm wrong. Second Life Today is about 20,000 or so server machines, each with a little tile of land. And taken together, uh, the land area of it is about actually the size of Los Angeles. There's about a million people that are in there uh, all the time. Um, they buy and sell things from each other because part of their lives there is to have jobs like we do. Thousands of people there call Second Life or Second Life is their first life job. Um, uh, the economy there, the GDP of Second Life is about, we could tell us the latest, but it's about, about a half a billion dollars a year in people, that, things that people buy and sell. And that's actually a lot if you consider that you don't have to buy, you know, uh, well, you don't have to thinking, you don't have to really buy food you sort of have to buy shelter and you certainly have to buy clothing <laughs> because what you look like there really matters, you know, to okay, you. Okay, so you create this thing, the size of it is Los Angeles. So if I have a plot in Second Life, I build, I build a house, what do I do there? Right, so what was different about Second Life in comparison to a video game, which was such an important ancestor to what Second Life is and what I think we're going into now, uh, the thing about Second Life was that you could build live. So you could click on a button and you could just start kind of pulling things into existence right here on the stage. And the other people that were standing there could see what you were doing in real time. And that idea that you could live edit, you know, that you could kind of, not with your hands as Jeremy, you were saying earlier, but with your mouse, you could reach out and click and move the table and stretch it up and put it over there and kind of create the world around you. That was the big idea, I think, retrospectively, that, that hadn't been really done before. Okay, so you've got about a million people per year operating. Per, per, per month. And, oh, per month, know, excuse yeah. me. A million people per 60, month. 60,000 right now in there. Op operating in this space where they have plots of land, they're building stuff, they're walking around, they're talking. You've created this world. How many people since 1999 have used it, approximately? I think the total number of people is north, I know, of like 10 million. So lots. I mean, just an enormous number of people that have actually uh, been into Second Life. Again, unlike a video game, Second Life is very real. A lot of, I went in there the other day and I went right, pulled up right next to me was one of the first guys who I remembered from the first few months of Second Life being operational. I was standing there in this London Square chatting with people and this guy named Michi walks up to me and he's like, hey, Philip. <laughs> so he's been there for, for, for 17 years. Yeah. All right. So we've set the context for what Second Life is and that uh, I think the surprising thing for people in the room is we all know it as this very big thing from years ago, but there's still a million people a month and there's still half a billion of transaction right. going on each year. So um, what I want to focus our conversation on today is what are people doing in there? Okay. Uh, and I want to talk about that from a micro standpoint in terms of the behaviors. I want to talk about it from a macro standpoint in terms of policies. One of the things we're going to get to is who made law in Second Life, right? Right, right. Uh, and who makes it, and who decides things. So, yeah. um, so why don't we start? You mentioned the London Square, but before we get into the extremes, the good and the bad, tell me what's the typical thing I go in Second Life and I spend a couple hours there. What am I going to see? if I'm avoiding the really dark places? What, what am I gonna see? Well, let's just imagine you look at this big overhead map. You could almost start there. There's a sort of a satellite map of Second Life. You can see it just like you'd look down on Google map. And you double click on that map and suddenly whoosh, you hear this really cool sound that we, uh, goes all the way back to like a decade ago. You hear this whoosh, and you're suddenly in, you're standing on the ground looking at yourself, looking like a video game. But there's all these people there. So the, the typical experience you might have would be to drop into a place and there's a dance, there's a live musician playing, and there's a bunch of people dancing. You can hear the guy, maybe you show up and he says, hey, Philip, good to see you, or you know, he doesn't know who you are, but he sees your name. You walk, you walk out of that, that, that plaza where people are dancing because you realize it's a real world, it's big. And you just sort of wander a little bit, and then off to the edge of that you might see a store. 
and the store, you know, it's obviously a store, it's got prices and signs and stuff, and you walk in there and it's gonna be, uh, you know, uh, women's shoes. And so you're browsing through women's shoes, and there's a couple of other people that are sitting there, and you see one of them download one of the shoes and put it on her feet, and you, you know, you go up and start chatting with her. I, I would say that's kind of a slice of life in the, in the regular and second life. Okay, um, so typically you're walking around, you're talking to people, you're dancing, you're buying clothes, and you're just generally social interacting. So yep. that's the, that's kind of the dream for if we were to go forward with massive, immersive VR social interaction. Those are the kind of things that, that, that we well, like. Well, I think it's, it, it is, as you said, it, it, the, the magic of VR, and to some extent Second Life as well, before it, was simply to emulate, you use that expression, the, 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 the literalism of using our bodies and using ourselves the way we're used to. Uh, you know, Second Life was kind of the first little baby step in that. Now I think with VR, we can push a lot farther. But yeah, you, you do everything normally. You might go into a classroom and listen to somebody speak. I know you've done that in there. Uh, you know, you could have any experience. Okay, so that's the, that's the kind of hope for the wonderful and the mundane. Let's talk about now the, the epic wins for people. Just, yeah. I want to hear, before we get to the dark stuff, because it's important to talk about that, tell me things that are going to warm my heart of, of, of things that have, people have done in Second Life that you couldn't have done otherwise or just, just really special. I think when I started Second Life, I was focused on the, the place. My, my kind of, I, my childish obsession, my... My continuing obsession is that of seeing a world whose physics and whose rocks and trees and birds and everything is entirely done inside the computer, is redone, the laws of physics. But what was really inspiring about Second Life, to get to your question, the epic moments were about people and the effect that it had on people. And that's a lot of what you've studied. And at the beginning, I didn't expect that. I was surprised by it. So, so for example, if you are disabled, imagine for a moment being able to put your hands on the keyboard and walk again and even fly. If you are older or quite old, you can be young again and re-enter society kind of at any age you would care to and interact with people. I remember I read a story, uh, I was looking back at, there's a guy who blogs a lot named Drax about Second Life. And he had a story about an 86-year-old woman, this is a today story, this is recently, who has Parkinson's and is pretty disabled by it. And she's all in in Second Life. She's living in there. She's, they, you know, the video, she's a mermaid and she's swimming around, you know, off an island as a mermaid and chatting with friends. But one of the things that's fascinating about this, and you know this, is that her health, her ability to walk and balance, which I hadn't heard about, her ability to balance with Parkinson's, was significantly improved through essentially watching herself walk uh, as an avatar and I guess projecting into that. So I think the epic wins are those. They're the impact on people's lives, the fact that somebody can change everything about their life. So that, that's what I think is, you know, the, that's what keeps me getting up in the morning uh, and, 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 you know, with great energy going to work and continuing to work on this stuff. Okay, so let's, let's take the opposite now, the, the things that are just horrible. Well, I guess one of them is, you know, we're all talking now about Bitcoin and the blockchain and all this stuff. Um, there's like, I remember one thing that was just really bad where you talk about who's going to, who regulates, who, who's the law, in, yeah. in, you know, inside something like Second Life. We sort of didn't want to be the law for the most part. We were very hands off with respect to how we did things in Second Life. To some extent, just by necessity, it was a big world and we couldn't, we couldn't police it. But one thing I remember was this Ponzi scheme where somebody started a bank in Second Life. In Second Life, you could move money around between people. You could do it with a script, a program, so it was very easy. So these guys started this bank that was like, we pay you 10% interest a month. And we said, well, uh, that's really a lot of interest. How will you invest this money? And it, we realized, of course, that I, I didn't even know what a Ponzi scheme was at the time. We realized, like, well... See, the thing is, the next people that come in and give you the money to deposit, you pay that as interest to those first people at 10%. And as a sort of an armchair economist, I hadn't been like, oh, wait a second now, that requires more and more people coming in. And so we, we, you know, we had to shut those guys down. You know, we had to do a number of things like that, gambling and the like. That's an economic one. I'd say probably the most horrible uh, human interactions was people would live out fantasies, and they'd live out any fantasy. So like you know, putting each other on a barbecue spit and cooking each other, you know, I mean, very violent, intense, uh, 
horrific uh, fantasies, so describe, but they were consenting. Describe that visually, and not to be gross, I'm actually not asking for uh, gore, just from a user perspective, what is the spinner seeing and yeah, what I is mean, the spinny seeing? Well, I mean, you're seeing exactly what it is. If you're the person being cooked, you're seeing yourself turning in circles. You know, you're seeing your screen in first person. The thing that was so odd was that, it, well, in Second Life, you could click on things and be animated by them. So you could click on a chair and sit down on it, but you could also, you know, click on a barbecue spit and get put on it, you know. So it was consensual in that you had people who wanted to do this together, but of course, I mean, is it? It was something we had to consider, again, as a attempting to be open and hands-off with respect to en enabling creativity. We were like, my God, are we to, what do we do when everybody wants to do something that's so terrible? Do we, do we say, we got to let you do that and learn from it, or do we not? Okay, um, this is the perfect time to segue into immersive VR, because being on a barbecue spit on a 2D screen using keys right. feels fundamentally different than in immersive VR, and everyone in this room has tried immersive VR. So yeah. um, you, your new company is called High Fidelity, yep. and it's an immersive VR version of Second Life, to put it simply. Yeah. Um, is it okay to do the barbecue spit in High Fidelity? Well, first of all, do we get to say whether things are okay? So as VR moves from a million people using it, you talked about governance, I believe that we don't happily we have to be, anything built at a, the scale of a billion, which is what we're going to now. When we talk about internet scale, we're talking about billions of people doing something. Right. I got, you know, had the, the great delight of getting to millions of people, but getting to billions is three orders of magnitude more and it's different. If you get to billions, everybody's got to run their own machines. I mean, my gosh, I hope so. Ready Player One or, you know, the fiction about this suggests that you could have a big company running the whole thing, but there's no way that's going to happen at the scale of the internet. Yeah. So first of all, I don't think we get to decide. As to whether I would say or, or take a position on whether you should be able to sort of be in first person in a headset in that experience, I don't know, Jeremy. I, I mean, I haven't really thought about it. I would say I don't know as much as I didn't then. I mean, it would be much more intense and gripping. But what does that say? I mean, it's still incredibly asymmetric and bizarre that people would do that. So I'm, I'm feeling a little bit of dodging on your, on your answer there. Yeah, uh, I don't uh, and, I think I think basically and, though, and, and, and I know you, and, and, and I, I know you're a fantastic person, and you don't want people to be roasting in barbecue spits, and 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 I, and I feel like there's this tension with all sorts of digital media right now, which is it's at a scale where you can't regulate case by case, but there's some bad stuff going on that's that's going to linger. Yeah, I I tell you what I think is I think if you dance with someone, there's this tension between your bodies, right? It's one of the things I think about a lot in VR because yeah. we're trying to recreate that. Like, how do you create the sense of holding someone's hand in VR? It's very hard. I mean, we, we, it's very hard technically, right? Because if I pull away, I can just pull away. I, we're not really holding each other. I think there's a tension in policy that's sort of, of a similar thing that, that you can't, uh, you've got to allow, we've got to be able to engage in these worlds enough for them to be real enough for us to use them as our collective future in many ways, our work future, our education future. So I can't, yeah. we uh, can't not do this right, stuff. So I'm gonna stop pushing you on this, but I'm gonna beg you here on the stage to think harder than you were planning on thinking about it. Is yeah. that fair? Sure. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so let's move. Um, and I wanna, so one of the things that, so that conversation was meant to set up a little bit the conversation between Janine and Chairman Wheeler. Chairman Wheeler played uh, a pretty intense video game yesterday in VR where he used his hands to do some violence and he's going to talk about that and, and how it lingered with him because in the moment these things think, okay, we're finding experimentally the effects because you're using your body, they linger. But let's shift um, and to another uh, FCC relevant conversation. I want to talk about latency. Okay, and I want to talk about 5G. And uh, you and I have shared a dream so since we've started doing this work and tell us about destroying the commute. Yeah, destroying the commute. So. We had a lot of our meetings in Second Life in rooms that we had built, and it was fantastic, right? But the question is, what are we doing right now, and why are we all here in a room together? We could have a big Skype call. I mean, it'd be kind of a pain, but we can do it. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we, though? And I've been working on this, and I'm, Jeremy, I'm obsessed with this. We're sitting here right now having this conversation, and we're pretty good at being present with each other, even though you guys are all here. What's going on? We're making eye contact. You can't do that with Skype. You guys all know that. 
There's another thing, though, that's very subtle, which is as we're speaking, as I'm speaking, Jeremy's moving a little bit. He's nodding. He's responding to me. He's helping me be on stage in front of you guys. He's saying, like, you're doing okay. You're doing okay. He's moving. <laughs> to do that, he, here's, the, here's the cool thing. To do that, he has to be separate. The, the motion of his body has to get to me within about 100 milliseconds, about a tenth of a second, maybe 150. The signal from him has to get to me, and then I give my movement back to him. If it's about 100 milliseconds or less, we can just believe everything works. If it's a lot more than that, it's a Skype call. It's a cell phone call. It's not good. So latency uh, is this incredibly important thing. I started High Fidelity right when the latency for a great internet Wi-Fi connection got low enough across the country to connect two people at 100 milliseconds. So let me you know, defend that you'd have to try it to, to believe it. But in High Fidelity, you put the headset on. We become avatars. We've done this lots. You shake hands. You sit here and talk. It feels real because we have that latency down to 100 milliseconds. But it's very hard in the equipment, in the network, to get that latency down. And so things like 5G will cut a significant you know, tens of milliseconds off that latency. Fantastic. Um, we must conclude this conversation. We have time for one question. No cards. Uh, one hand raise, if there's a hand raise. He's got one. Yes. Yeah. I think reality lies in our identity. It, it, it pro probably. It lies in the persistence that we have as people of being ourselves and of having a history of knowing other people and interacting with them. The virtual lies in the possibility of imagination. You know, we can fly, we can build cities on the moon, we can build another planet. Um, I think that's kind of the virtual part of it. But I think the grounding part is a combination of our own identity. And the rules of that, you know, what does it mean to be an avatar and not be Jeremy Balenson? What does it mean to be that avatar that is Jeremy? We don't know that yet. I mean, we're constructing it, all of us, the whole ecosystem, not just me. Uh, I think the virtual part is the part where holding that identity and holding our relationships kind of as they were and the experience of this as close as it can be to this changing this whole room around us, you know, and, and taking flight into another galaxy, but still being who we are. I mean, that's how I, that's how I would connect with you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. Cool. Good job. All right. All right, how's everybody doing? Good. All right. So it's my, can you hear me? Oh, yeah. All right. It's my great pleasure to welcome to Stanford and to engage in conversation with Tom Wheeler, a businessman, author, and chairman of the Federal Communications Commission from 2013 to 2017 under President Obama. He's now a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington and at Harvard's Kennedy School. And I wanted to take this little reminder because Mark Dizzuti made these beautiful uh, little bio sheets for you. So in the interest of time, we put everybody's fuller bio so you can read Dr. Cogburn's full bio and everybody else's bios right here on your table. But I can't really think of anyone better to have this conversation with to talk about new consumer media, virtual reality, and the future of technology regulation than Chairman Wheeler, who spent four decades thinking about telecommunication networks and services. So I'm going to chat with Tom for about 25 minutes. And Tobin Asher is going to walk around and get questions um, in around 15 minutes. So get your questions ready, and then we'll try and integrate them. Uh, Tom, let's just dive right into the sort of issue du jour of net neutrality. I've heard of that. Yeah. One of the, oh, President Obama's signature policies while you were the chairman of the FCC, right. protecting an open internet. And during your previous visit to Stanford's Virtual Human Interaction Lab in 2016, you said, virtual reality shouldn't have gatekeepers. It starts with an internet that is fast, fair, and open. And now the Trump administration, as this audience will well know, has repealed um, net neutrality. In fact, just yesterday, I think it submitted to the Federal Registry the new Restoring Internet Freedom Order, 
which has a name that maybe is not exactly what it is, but never mind. Um, talk about what this repeal means in terms of virtual reality and the kinds of innovations that we're talking about tonight, but more broadly for us. Well, Janine, the first thing is that I'm stunned that Jeremy was listening when I was in the lab and I said, we have to have something that's fast, fair, and open. But, but um, uh, so look, for about two-thirds of American consumers, you have one choice in how you get access to the Internet. Um, and there's, you know, there are four companies, Comcast, AT&T, Verizon, and Charter, that supply the service for three quarters of American households, most of them on an uncompetitive basis. That puts them in a position to, you use the term gatekeepers, to have a chokehold. And to determine um, who gets into your house and on what terms. To decide that they want to turn your internet service into something like your cable service. Where, oh, you want that service? Well, that's another $15 a month. Uh, or, or this kind of a decision making. What has made the internet the internet? and has been as transformative as it has been, is the fact that anybody could get on. And, uh, you know, Philip and I were talking earlier today about the, um, the, the, the way in which the throughput of the Internet has changed the experience of the Internet. Virtual reality is going to require significant throughput, and as we just heard, significant improvements in latency. Now the question becomes, should Comcast have the decision to say, oh, you know, Jenny, happy to do that, but listen, I've got a service that I provide, and, um, and I'm favoring that with a fast lane that will deliver to you. Uh, the optimal service, and and you know I know that Phillips got something over here, but but he's going to be in the slow lane. So he's so if I want to use high fidelity, I'm going to have to pay like three ninety nine a month extra. If if you that's one version. The other version is I'm sorry, it just doesn't come through as fast as mine mm -hmm. does. You know we're seeing it today, an example. We're seeing it today, with AT and T having bought Direct Television. Um, and they are now providing to AT&T customers free wireless delivery of television programming from DirecTV. But if you're a DISH subscriber, oh, I'm sorry, we're going to charge you for every megabit you use to deliver the competitor's product. We need to have a fast fair and open internet for things like virtual reality and other kinds of activities to be able to flourish. So in the Senate, they're sounding hopeful that they could reverse this. They could get 50, they have 50 votes, I think, now. But is this a quixotic, symbolic move in your part? Just to ask one policy, sorry, Washington wonky question for a moment. Because they're not going to have the votes in the House, and the president's certainly the president, not going. He's president not going to. But I think it's really important. What's the outlook here for actually maybe reversing this? Well, I think, A, I think it's important that, that members of Congress, particularly the Senate, get on record. Where are you on the question of who will control the most important and decisive network of the 21st century? And then to your question of what happens to these rules, and boy, do I agree with you. I mean, the internet, restoring internet freedom, what a line, what a bunch of malarkey. Um, but um, they have to go to court. They've now been, they've been challenged uh, already. Petitions were filed in, in court yesterday, and the law requires that the FCC has to make its decisions 
on the record based on the facts in the record. And I think they're going to have a hard time going to court and saying, you know, things have changed so drastically in two years that we just have to throw everything out and start again. Now, it all depends on the court they get. Mm. But, um, but I think that's a fight that we have to fight, and, and I'm glad to see that folks are out there doing it. So again, when you were here a couple years ago, you talked about two things you were thinking about, broadband mm -hmm. and privacy. Right. So let's take them one at a time. There was a mention of 5G, and um, there's some criticism about how the Trump administration, you yourself, about how they're thinking about this. For the non, well, everybody's a techie in this room, but what is the significance of this whole 5G debate? What should we understand about it when it comes to virtual wireless, reality? Wireless fiber. Mm -hmm. So the ability to deliver at speeds that uh, are similar and, and, and latency, similar to what you experience on fiber, and to get it wirelessly. Um, and, you know, they, uh, they, first generation, second generation, third, fourth, this is now the fifth generation of wireless technology. And we'll begin to see some iterations of it rolling out in the next year or so. And so the president has talked about maybe doing it via the government versus... Well, it's an interesting situation that, that um, the National Security Council floated, leaked, I don't know what the right term is, but it ended up out, a document that said, we're worried about the cybersecurity in 5G, which is an incredibly legitimate concern. We passed a rule and started an inquiry process to say that we will not allow 5G technology into this country unless it has cyber protections built in from the outset. With 4G and everything else, cyber has been an afterthought. Our point was you need to make it a forethought. As soon as the Trump administration came in, the FCC repealed that requirement. So there was no requirement that there be cybersecurity in the 5G standard. And there are several other things where the FCC has walked away from their cyber responsibility. This article you were citing, mm -hmm. I, I said they were AWOL on cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. And so the National Security Council turned around and said, well, wait a minute. How are we then going to have cyber protection in this new high-speed, ubiquitous wireless network. I guess the government ought to build it and, uh, and own it. And um, I, it's probably, probably not the wisest decision to say to the government, we want you to build this, this new uh, network. And it's definitely um, a bad situation that is a result of very poor decisions to walk away from basic cybersecurity requirements. But we're in a deregulatory mode. And so, you know. That's the explanation. From, that's so, why they're pushing. And so if the industry doesn't like it, then. So is the government just doing the bidding of the Comcast of the world? Why is this ha all happening, these kinds of things, in your view? <laughs> um, you know, Janine, um, I felt that my job was that I was representing the consumers of the United States. And I came out of the industry. They were all my friends. Notice the past tense. Um, and, um, and, um, but I thought that my job was to represent the consumers in a competitive, in, in assuring a competitive and innovative market. I don't believe that that's the ongoing mindset of this administration. Okay, let's shift to privacy, which I think is on the minds probably of people here. Pre my understanding is President Obama, he really, he went beyond a little bit. He tried to push crafted rules that the internet service providers couldn't share 
your data with third parties about your habits, like the fact that I streamed The Keepers last night on Netflix. Anybody see The Keepers? Oh, never mind. All right. On Netflix last night, without my permission. I would need to say, you can say that I streamed The, the Keepers, mm. right? But that got thrown out by Trump and Congress, as my good friend Mike Swift here tonight said in a New York Minute. And 69 days is the 69 uh, days, a little longer than a New York too. Minute. So when you think about VR as a medium where the immersion has, yeah. has been described tonight is so, it's just, they're not, it's not, they're only not checking what I'm buying on Amazon on my phone now. Now they're checking how I move and how I respond emotionally. And they're keeping all that data. What are we going to do in terms of privacy? Who is going to regulate this? What role should government play, if any? Well, um, we passed rules uh, that said that the networks needed to uh, give you three things. One, they needed to give you notice as to what they were doing with the information that they were seeing about you going over there networks. Mm -hmm. Two, they needed to, um, to give, to, they needed to protect that information and you know we're always hearing about breaches and all this sort of stuff. But three and most important of all, it wasn't their information, it was your information. And you had the right to describe how it could be used. You had to affirmatively consent to them using it. Now, the networks got all upset about this, um, and, um, and the, the, the 2016 election delivered them a, a Congress and an administration uh, that would support their efforts in this. And their argument was, it's not fair. Because Google and Facebook and all those folks, the FCC is not regulating them. And here is Wheeler over here trying to say, this is what we can do with, with our information. So I was up before a Senate hearing when they were expressing their discontent with what I was doing. And I reached into my pocket and I said, Senator, you know, you make a telephone call on this device. And the FCC rules require that that's a private conversation including the network setup information that says Tom's calling Janine and here's this, how this whole thing is working. But you use this same device and the same network to go to a website and now you have lost total control. Why is it that it's important in one instance and not in another? And so what we did was put in place rules that for the areas that we were responsible for um, created that kind of synergy, or that, that symmetry. And, um, and as I say, uh, shortly after the Congress, new Congress came in, they repealed those rules. And went beyond that, they even said that the FCC could never again, they enacted a law saying the FCC could never again enact rules like that. So let's talk about this. I mean, all right, again, the, so correct me if I'm wrong. The Communications Act of 1934 created the FCC at a time when we're talking predominantly about radio. Right. So are you saying, and this question may give heartburn to the audience, so I apologize, but do we need a new kind of agency or a new kind of act that would deal with issues, the kind of issues you're talking about? The fact that there's certain regulations on this but not that, that, that deals with the wild west of the smartphone and the internet? I think there are two answers to that, Janine. One is the um, academic, hypothetical, wouldn't it be nice if the act was updated to reflect what exists today rather than 1996, which was the last time, and you know, the internet was AOL at mm -hmm. that point in time, right? Um, and, um, and, and the answer to that is, of course, there's a lot of things have changed and there can be updating. <clears throat> I think the other side of it is the real politic side of it. And that is particularly when you've got the Congress that you've got now, 
is their hope of getting the kind of protections that are necessary and ought to exist in this new kind of environment. Here's the, here's the challenge. We're existing in a world right now where as a result of the Trump administration's decisions, the rules are being made by the people who are running the networks and the platforms. The question is, when will the people and their representatives step up? And will they have an opportunity to? And that's a political question that I think we've got to look later this year to see if we can begin to get an answer to. But so your question has, has two levels of answers, both the yes and what the ideal would be and then what the practical is. Um, let's talk about coming back to VR more directly, uh, VR and children. There are people in the audience who are working a lot on kids and, and technology. Uh, we have experts here um, on children's television and the, the Children's Television Act, which required that broadcast mm -hmm. television air programming specifically designed to serve educational informational needs of children. It sounds like such a romantic notion now in 2018 in many ways. Limit the amount of time that broadcasters can vote to vote to advertisements, right? I don't know who does that now on, on the on the do they do that? I no, guess it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't really happen, but on the iPad. But um, so as Jeremy's book, for those of you who haven't read it yet, you'll see shows there's just and as 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 Courtney's presentation and, and Philip's work, I mean, all of it shows the enormous potential for the positive. But there's also the negatives in VR. And and um, those of us who look at this worry about what that will mean for children. So is there a role that government should play? And I don't know if it's the FCC in regulating the kind of content that comes out of VR broadly, but in, for children in particular? So um, rule number one is that the First Amendment is pretty explicit in terms of government can't interfere with speech. How do you get to children's television rules then? Mm -hmm because children's television rules only apply to broadcasting. Because there was a Supreme Court decision called the Red Lion case, in the early days of, of broadcasting, that said that because broadcasters were using the public's airwaves, that the public had a right through their representatives to say, nope, wait a minute, you're using our property, we can constrain what you do in your exercise of free speech. But when you're using cable television, which is not using the public's airwaves, or when you're using the internet, which is not using the public's airwaves, then there is uh, no such ability of government. Here's the, I, I think the question you raise is an incredibly important question. Mary and I were talking at, at dinner tonight. And she was, in essence, if I can put words in your mouth, asking, asking the question, uh, you know, um, are you hopeful or are we headed over the cliff? Mm. Um, and, um, and, and I think that the excitement of the kind of work, for instance, that Jeremy is doing is that it's helping us understand the effects of the new technologies so that we can then make educated decisions about how society ought to be responding. And here's my takeaway. I loved the book Sapiens. And, um, and I'm sitting there reading it. And I get to the point where he's making the, 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 the point that, that only two animals have been domesticated by man, the horse and the dog. And of the two, the dog has also domesticated man. And every night when my dog hops up on my bed and I go, oh, you're the world's greatest dog, you know, <laughs> I remember this line out of the book. 
I think that one of the exciting things that's happening here, the kind of work, as I said, that Jeremy's doing, is it's helping us identify how we collectively engage in the domestication of where the new technology is going. And it's back to Mary's point. It ain't going to be easy. It is going to be politically explosive. Um, uh, it is going to be incredibly painful. But we have done this before. I, it's, I, I, I need to do two things. One, uh, Jeremy's uh, new book, uh, Virtual Media, uh, go out, get it if you haven't. Uh, already. Number two, I have a book coming out in August. <laughs> and, and what that book talks about is the historical um, response to new technologies, new network technologies in particular. And the message is basically, hey, we're not living through anything different than we have seen before when networks have come in and shaken the roots of commerce and culture. And so we are at this point today because our predecessors dealt with those challenges in a highly imperfect, highly human manner, but dealt with them to create the reality of today. And our challenge is, okay, we now have this set of, uh, of, of, of new, innovative uh, economic and social forces on our plate. How are we going to deal with it? And I happen to think that it is an incredibly exciting time, and the kind of work that's being done here is incredibly important in resolving those answers. Well, you're making me feel better, because I'm a little bit alarmist on these things. And when you think about it, though, I mean, Jeremy would maybe say differently, but I mean, is it the same? You're saying we have the precedent, but when you're in VR, you're totally immersed. And it, it's different than, I mean, we were all, I guess people were scared of the radio and film and TV, right? But now you're totally immersed. And then you're going to have light field capturing for people who understand that in here. And instead of, you know, we're not just watching video anymore. We're not just typing. We're not just listening. You are but that's, so, but that, that's why this is important. That's why, that's why you know, we got to pay, pay attention to folks like Jeremy. So is it, but, what are the effects of that? Here's what's important. The, what is significant about new technology is not, the, the, the primary effect of new technology is not the new technology itself. It is its secondary impact. So the question is not VR, and yes, we're going to have all the new whiz-bang stuff. The question is, what is the effect of VR? And we have to study, we have to, we have to get our arms around that so that we know how to deal with it. And I believe in the resiliency of mankind to, uh, to deal with those issues provided facts and not fiction. Quick story. When, 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 when um, Samuel F.B. Morris strung his first telegraph line from Washington to Baltimore, two weeks later, his operator up there telegraphed back, we need to shut this down because the clergy in Baltimore had decided that sending messages by sparks could only be black magic and a tool of the devil, and they were threatening to riot. Okay? Now, I think Jeremy is going to give us the facts that keep us from rioting. But they're going to demand that we do something to be responsive. So let's end this portion here on that question of responsibility. Because I feel like you're beating around the bush a little bit, honestly. What? Yeah. You're saying we got to do something, but I'm not coming away with this knowing. And I'm living in a hyper state of anxiety about the era of noise that we're in right now. And you wrote an op-ed in the New York Times this week mm -hmm. suggesting some things about APIs. And we can talk about that for a minute. But who is fundamentally responsible for, the for correcting these potential misuses of technology? The guy on the... What'd you call it? The barbecue stick, or no, the people's the, representatives. 
the, the, the people, the, 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 we live in a democratic republic where there are individuals who have fiduciary responsibilities. And today, my personal opinion is, they're looking the other way. So I have to go to Anna Eshoo's office and say, Anna Eshoo, I'm worried about fake video, or I need to go to Manish, who's working on the solution to that right now? Or does it need to be a partnership? What does this solution look like? We're here at Stanford. Mm -hmm. We are positioned here to have an impact on all of these issues. In this very room, we have the academics, and we have the, the companies, and we have the government all here together in a very unusual setting that Jeremy created, right? So what does the solution look like when it comes to fixing these problems? So, um, first of all, thank God for Anna Eshoo. Uh, yeah, she's great. What a great job. I love her. You know, I don't mean, I'm just calling her, I'm pointing her office. And, and straight what, up a, that road. You know, what a great, what a great ally she was in some yeah. of the things we were trying to do. Yeah. Um, but it starts with us. All right. So the work that Jeremy's doing is important. The question is, what are we as citizens going to do ourselves to get the story across to um, our legislators? Um, and regulators, and then I think we need to also start thinking anew. We are currently addressing 21st century challenges in 19th century terms. Um, our government is structured in a way that was created in the industrial age. We need to have, one of the things I tried to do, and in, in, in three specific instances, all of which have now been repealed by the Trump FCC, was to adapt the ideas of agile software development into regulation. How do you have agile regulation that changes as, as technology and, and the marketplace changes? How do we say Computer science got us into this mess. What's computer science going to do to get us out? And how are we going to establish expectations on those who today are using computer science to drive profit, to use computer science to protect people? And those are the kinds of debates that we have to have, but we are running away from. One of the great lines in Jeremy's book is he paraphrases Marshall McLuhan in saying that we never really understand what's gonna be happening because we define it in terms of what we know today. We need, to be, we need to be recognizing that we have moved out of the industrial age and and, and, and how are we going to harness the new realities that are creating the problems to also be solutions to the problem? And we need to start talking to our representatives about that. You know, I was in, I was in seeing a very senior United States senator about 10 days ago, talking about this article, that the, the, this idea that was in the New York Times. And he turns to me and he says, now remind me again, what's an API? Your idea being, let's let the social media companies open up the open, APIs open their APIs in a way that we as academics and as, as people can actually analyze it for, and, and show what's actually happening. Not that in a way that tr you know, triggers violations or threatens their intellectual property. But we, have to have, yeah. but, but we have to have an understanding of what's happening because we're still thinking about things. So did you explain API to uh -huh, the senator? Uh-huh. And then what happened? He thought it was a good idea. <laughs> no, but I mean, the problem is, and, and, and he's one of the more forward-thinking senators. Uh, but, I, but again, I'm hopeful in this. I mean, I, when I was representing the cellular industry, I would go in and say, and this was a, a decade ago, I would go in and say, we got a spectrum shortage. We need more spectrum. And the congressmen and senators would look at me, and they're kind of glaze over. Spectrum, what's that? Spectrum, the airwaves, we need to, okay. 10 years later, I'm making my rounds in the Senate for the confirmation. One of the first three things every senator says, what are you gonna do about Spectrum? 
And I'm saying to myself, okay, it takes a while for these things to be processed. Um, and, um, and therefore, we have a role to make sure that processing occurs and to say, no, don't go debate it in terms of 19th century ideas. Let's talk about new, new, new approaches to old problems. Well, I know we said we're going to have time for questions, but we don't. I want to be sensitive to people's time. So please join me in thanking Chairman Wheeler for joining us. <laughs> And thank you to everybody again for coming tonight. We hope you enjoyed the McClatchy Symposium. Take care. Mm -hmm.